Welcome to this week's episode of Caged Minds Uncensored. I'm Micah Frankel. Got a shit ton of stuff to talk about. I mean, there's a Bellator heavyweight tournament. Conor McGregor's lost his mind. Bellator's jumping into the WWE universe. There was UFC. There was local boxing. And joining me right away to talk about some of this stuff is 610K and ML's Michael Carlisle. How you doing, sir? I'm good, Mike. How are you? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Out of all that stuff I mentioned, where do you want to start off first? <laughs> Listen, you know what? Let's start with the Bellator Heavyweight Tournament. It's interesting. There's a lot of names in it, but almost half the guys in the tournament aren't actually heavyweights. That is the most surprising part of it to me. And I mean, I want to know how, actually, to me, the most surprising part would be how many bitter, hurt feelings are there in the Bellator family right now? Because jumping off to me are the names not in this tournament. Bobby Lashley, Chet Congo, these guys that have been putting in work, I believe, for the Bellator division the last couple of years. But instead, we have a lot of UFC alums in that tournament. What do you think? No, I, I'm with you on that. Look, I get a kick out of Chael Sonnen as much as the next guy. I don't know why he's in this heavyweight tournament. I like King Mo, but he seems grossly uh, you know, uh, out of place here with, with some of these guys. I don't know what Quentin Rampage Jackson brings to the table anymore. I, look, I, I like the names. I, mean, I know Bellator's big on, on names, you know, even if their guys pass their prime. But, you know, <sighs> who's Fedor beating? And, and I love Fedor. Last time we saw Fedor, he lasted about 30 seconds. This is an interesting tournament. I, I think it'll actually get a lot of interest for people just because of the names. But from a quality standpoint, I, I don't know how this plays out exactly. Yeah, that's got to be my feelings, too. I mean, people have already started the rumors of, didn't Frank Mir come to Bellator to fight Fedor? It would almost be a shame, though, to lose those guys in the first round as we're looking at light heavyweights really contending to the title. And the only thing that makes me think about King Mo being in the tournament, he did win the Ryzen Openweight Tournament, and he is actually the last person to hand Chet Congo a loss. So I think King no, Mo true. deserves to be in there. It's Rampage. It's Chow Sutton that really makes me shake my head. Yeah, and look, uh, as far as Fedor and Frank Mir, you know they've got to put those guys against each other in the first round because you can't set it up and put them on opposite sides of the bracket because chances are one or both of them won't make it to the finals. And, and that's the other thing. Are we doing light heavyweights versus each other? I mean, we've had King Mo versus yeah. Ryan Bader booked and then canceled. So, do they make that one early? Do you keep them away from each other? Because that would almost, with Mo winning, hey, I'm the light heavyweight champion of Bellator. It, it seems a little shady to me, a little crazy. Same thing with, I guess, Rampage and Chal have talked trash to each other before. That's a first round matchup. And then that leaves us down to Roy Nelson versus Matt Mitrione rematch. And I think Matt Mitrione becomes the favorite in this tournament. No, I think he's absolutely the favorite in this tournament. And barring injury or anything, really wacky happening, he's probably your odds-on favorite. The only wacky thing is, is he got hit by Fedor, too. He's been dropped and clipped in yeah. every one of his fights, and the fear with Meathead, even though he doesn't have the mileage from fighting that some of these guys do because he had all that time in the NFL, that still, though, brain trauma, the day he gets clipped and knocked out, it's probably going to be something disgusting because of how hurt he's been and been able to make it through it. I think it's going to be one of those moments where he thinks he's okay and it's going to go way downhill. Yeah, you know, you could be right on that. And you're right if you think back to, to his fight with Fedor that they both hit each other at the same time and went down. Mitrion, uh, frankly, just recovered more quickly than, than Fedor did. But, you know, you look at everybody else in the tournament, anybody Mitrion steps in the cage with, he's got to be considered the favorite, right? Except, I think, except against Roy Nelson. That's the one fight that I'd be a little bit scared because Roy is still taking shots very well. And even though his ground game was more than apparently lackluster, Buster, 
against uh, in his debut for Bellator. He still has that advantage, and he still holds a victory over Mitrione. So it becomes a weird thing where if they do meet up in the first round, I got that guy as the odds-on favorite. And depending on how it shakes out, Ryan Bader could hold two titles because if it shook out where a final is Ryan Bader, Roy Nelson, or Ryan Bader, Matt Mitrione, I almost want to give Bader the advantage because of his athleticism, his fight IQ, and his wrestling ability. Yeah, you know, Bader maybe is kind of the wild card in all this. I don't know that he makes it to the finals, though. I'm kind of curious, you know, say what you want about Bellator, but they seem to always have a plan, you know, what they want the outcome to be. Getting there is a completely different story. I'm curious what Scott Coker and Bellator want out of this, because, look, again, with all due respect to some of these guys, is Chael Sonnen carrying the heavyweight division? Is Rampage Jackson carrying the heavyweight division? At this point in their careers, I don't think so. So in some ways, Maybe they are looking at a Bader, you know, winning a second title, you know, maybe giving up the one he's got now, or heck, maybe depending on both. I don't know. I, this is just really kind of bizarre to me. And also with their announcement, as we're talking about bizarre, it really didn't make any note, a specification of date and times. Because this is Bellator. You're talking about eight matchups. <laughs> Eight matchups, I'm sure they're trying to milk that for at least four events just in the semifinals, where each semifinal is a main and co-main event of a Bellator card. Oh, I think they will milk this for, for the majority of 2018. Unless some things happen early on, and maybe people start to lose interest. But uh, yeah, I'm guessing in the perfect world, Bellator is going to try to milk this for all it's worth. So, as we sit here talking about the announcement in November, November 2018, do we have a Bellator champion, or you think they hold it out till December? I th- you know what? Uh, and I don't know what their schedule is for 2018. I, I think they probably try to go to, to the middle of December. I almost, with them, wouldn't be surprised if there's, like, a New Year's card come 2018 transitioning to 2019, kind of in a Pride-esque version of that's where the finals are or something. I wonder, though... Yeah, I I could... Yeah. I wonder when they... something like that. So it's it's some sort of tent pole event where you've got some some kickboxing and, and, you know... Some some foreign fighters coming in. You know, some sort of New Year's Day. I can see something like that. You also got to wonder when they start talking about the um, the uh, replacement bouts. Who's going to be the reserves? You got to <laughs> wonder again. Like I said, what is Chet Congo and Bobby Lashley thinking? Sitting here like, hey, uh, hey, 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 Scott, we've been fighting in this division a, a lot longer than well, like those four light heavyweights. <laughs> Yeah, if, if I'm both of those guys, I, I'm upset. If I'm Bobby Lashley, I am furious because I, I've dedicated a huge chunk of my career splitting time between Bellator and, and doing some pro wrestling stuff. I, I think the fans are really into Lashley. I was surprised he was not on this list. Now, also not on this list. I'm not sure if he's even fighting in this division, but you texted me a little bit ago. That on a Ariel Hawani show on the MMA Hour, Bellator has broke news that former WWE talent Jack Swagger, uh, Jack Hager, has signed a deal with Bellator MMA. They like their collegiate wrestlers, but this guy's a, a little old in the tooth, and whether you say pro wrestling's fake or not, that is wear and tear on the human body. No, it, it is. And look, he's got the background. He wrestled at Oklahoma. He set an Oklahoma single season record for most pins in a season with 30. He was an All American at uh, 285 pounds. The problem is he's 35 years old and has never competed professionally in MMA. Uh, you know, look, I'm all about guys switching jobs, whatever, doing something different. But at 35 years old, even in Bellator, where age doesn't seem to be quite the issue it is elsewhere, I don't know how successful he can be. 
Bellator does not care about rankings. They, they, they do things a little kookier. Things a little kookier. Scott Croker is about entertainment. And if we go back looking at like the very beginning of MMA in Japan, you had kooky matchups where pro wrestlers, a lot of pro wrestlers jumped into that pride ring. The fact that Swagger has that collegiate wrestling background... I'm a little more on board with this move than you are a CM Punk to an outrageous contract to the UFC. This isn't as big a name, but Scott Croker being a fan of the Japanese style of promoting, I see where he's getting this idea from. I just don't know, even with the catchphrase, We the People, which I think it was just a catchy catchphrase and that's why a whole arena did it. I don't know, outside of Oklahoma, I believe, where he wrestled, if anybody cares. Mm -hmm. But Thackerville, Oklahoma, nope. is a constant destination for Bellator. Maybe this was a smart move. Yeah, and, and that's a good point. And look, I'm with you. I think this is a better signing for Bellator than CM Punk was for UFC. Look, CM Punk had no amateur background. You know, it, at least Jack Swagger you know, was a collegiate wrestler and a very good one. But, you know, part of it, he's not even going to be be able to use the name that, that people know him from, the, the swagger name. Uh, he's going to have to go with, with, with Jack Hager. And, you know, maybe to some people that's a big deal. Some people it's not. I think the casual fans, the, the, the fans that drift back and forth between pro wrestling and MMA, I do think that makes a difference. And maybe uh, that makes it a little harder for people to get into him and, and get behind him. Um, yeah, look, with the amateur background... I think he'll do okay. It's just 35 years old seems like a odd point in life to to switch over from the pro wrestling game to the mixed martial uh, mixed martial arts game. I'd almost agree with you if Bobby Lashley wasn't already sitting in this conversation, waving his hand, telling us that he's isn't he like 44 years old or some shit. The guy looks incredible, but I believe he's in his 40s, isn't he? Uh, he's probably up there, but, you know, he's been doing this for a while now, too. Well, well, that's my point, though. I think he's in his mid-40s, so he would have jumped in somewhere, I'm thinking, in his early 30s. I'm thinking Jack Swagger is only actually a couple years behind the path that Bobby Lashley has taken. Now, the other thing, which we're not paying attention to Ariel Helwani's show, is we're talking, we're not hearing Jack's, Jack Hager talk about how long this move had been in his thought process, or how long he's been training for. Yeah, no, right now, Bobby Lashley started MMA, yeah, actually, he's been in it for about nine years, and he's 41 right now, so he jumped in at about 32. Like I said, Jack Swagger about three years older. Maybe that will make a huge difference, but then again, there's athletic freaks like Herschel Walker, who Scott Coker signed to Strike Force. Yeah, I, uh, maybe. And, and look, I, I like the guy as a wrestler. I, I hope he's successful in MMA. I just, I, I, I have my doubts, that's all. And hopefully I'm wrong on that. The guy is not going to strike. He's going to be a wet blanket with a double leg to a single leg. And he's going to look like Bobby Lashley in his early fights, just blanketing guys. But if you go look at Bobby Lashley's early record, we may be able to pin down a couple of the premier opponents for Jack Swagger that Bellator will line up. See if we can find a couple guys. Because it is Bellator. Yeah. And I, I think... Aaron Pico, Zach Freeman, that's not the path. That was an anomaly. We'll look at some of these other matchups that they've given that Ed Ruth had in the prelims. I think that's more what we're going to get, but you're going to get it on a big stage because they're going to try to capitalize off that name of Jack Hager and how they work the swagger into it, the former professional wrestler. I can see them doing this. I can kind of understand it, and I believe... It's not a long-term move. It is a short-term move. Probably, but, you know, if it works out well, then who knows? Um, you know, Scott Coker is a guy who does things a little bit differently, and if Jack Hager, the man with swagger, uh, there you go. Feel free to use that one, Scott. Exactly. Uh, but, but if it works out and he's successful, then, you know, well, why the heck not? I wonder which one of us was going to say that one first. I was thinking it, but I just couldn't throw it out there. <laughs> so you beat me to it. But yeah, 
You never know what this is going to open, and dare I even say Ryback, because I swear I heard he was in negotiations with them at one point, too. Uh, Ryan, too. Uh, Ryan Reeves, also a former WWE talent, if you guys don't keep up with the professional wrestling world. You know, maybe, you know, there was a talk, you know, UFC apparently is, is going to get into the uh, boxing promotion game now. Maybe Bellator could just start their own wrestling federation. You never know. There is Bellator MMA, Bellator kickboxing, Bellator pro wrestling would not be too far off. You already got the stage, you, know, you already got the ramp. And Exactly, and then Coker could bring Ken Shamrock back. Oh my gosh, of course. Of course we're going to go that low. But now also, Bellator had an interesting situation this weekend, and I have no clue... How you talk sense in a Conor McGregor, because the man has none at all. I'm sure the whole world's heard by now. After his teammate Charlie Ward scores a vicious left hand knockout victory, that Mark Hunt jumping in left hook knocks out John Redman, which was an exciting bout. Redman had landed a knee right before that punch that had busted Ward open. But who cares about the fight? Afterwards, Conor McGregor's so excited for his teammate. From being ringside, not a corner man, just ringside, he was just in a, a sweatsuit, jumps the cage and gets into a celebration, obviously not allowed to be there, and he's pushing officials, attacking officials, yelling at officials. The fuck do we do with this, Carlisle? Yeah, okay. Well, first of all, what a coup for Bellator, <laughs> having the opportunity to, to put Conor McGregor into your show, um, you know, Twice. free of charge. Uh, so, so... Good on Bellator for that, I guess. But you look, you're 100% right. Conor McGregor has no business leaping over a cage, no matter what the situation is. You know, you wait a couple minutes, let the referee get order in the ring. I guess there was some question whether or not the knockout punch came before or after the end of the round. So let everything get sorted out, and then go in and celebrate with your teammate. I've had no problems with Conor wanting to celebrate with his teammate. Where the problem comes in is where... Any idiot, in this case it was McGregor, but look, it could have been any fan, he was sitting ringside, uh, can be allowed to run, jump over the cage, and get in like that. I mean, that's a dangerous situation. And then kind of gets into it with uh, the referee, they're, they're tripping over, the, the, the poor dude who just got knocked out. Uh, luckily, it didn't turn as nearly as ugly as it could have, but that's a situation that we could be talking about a lot differently today. Conor McGregor was not a licensed corner man, to my knowledge, for that night. If he is... That is correct. If he is, though, let's say somehow he is, then he is subject to a lot of suspensions, and I heard the minimum would be threat three months coming from Chow Sutton. He would be gone for a year to a year and a half. If he is liable, I believe, to the ABCs for everything that he has done, I believe a year to a year and a half suspension is how they would come down on him. But it appears, like we said, he's not a corner man, right? He was not licensed, right? Correct. Then he needs to be in handcuffs and he needs to be arrested for two charges of battery. He attacked Mark Goddard, the referee. He also pushed mm -hmm. another official. And if this was any other man besides an MMA superstar who all of a sudden had a team of bodyguards around him, that fan would have been arrested and then would have been charged heavily for obstructing the event, jumping in, and then putting his hands on officials. So you're either, you're a cornerman and you need to be su suspended, or you're not, and you need to be arrested to the full extent of the law because you're a criminal at this point. The furthermore is he cannot control himself. It has been proven now with the Charlie Ward fight. It has been proven with the Artem Levin fight. This goes to the people at SBG. They need to control their, their fighter, or they need to tell him he has got to stay at home. He cannot travel with the team to venues for fights because he is losing control. He is giving them a bad name. He is giving himself a bad name, and he is causing illegal actions to happen. He must stay at home for the good ship of their team. Micah, 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 this isn't some regular Joe we're talking about. This isn't even some average fighter. This is Conor effing McGregor. He does what he wants, and people allow him to do this. Look, I'm with you. There should be, I don't know that he should be suspended for a year and a half or thrown in handcuffs. There should be some repercussions for him 
crawling over the cage like that and getting involved, you know, in a situation in, in a place where he had no business being involved. But the fact of the matter is, the business needs Conor McGregor right now. Conor McGregor right now more than Conor McGregor needs the business. Worst case scenario for Conor, he's getting a slap on the wrist, and honestly, he's probably not getting that. This is where the ABC would then have to make a statement. This is going to the Rules Committee. Because mm -hmm. I can understand, Dana White ain't touching this. Bellator embraced it, and they loved it. This goes on to the commission. To It is on their right, for their people need to claim assault or battery, and there has to be actions taken. Because I can understand, all right, it's Conor McGregor, we're going to let it go. What if it was a drunken fan? What would the repercussions gone? What have the actions have been? Then you've got to tell me why you allow it to be Conor McGregor, why we allow all these rules to be made for him. I understand that pay-per-view buy rates would go down in a little bit. That is the UFC's problem, not the ABC's problem. No, look, I, I agree with you on that. But doesn't some of the blame for this either fall on maybe not Bellator, but at the very least uh, the, the security of the arena? Because you, you brought up a point, what if this was a drunken stand? And, and look, that's a fair point, but where was security keeping a uh, McGregor or a drunken stand, whatever, from, from running in like that? Look, nobody came near him until after he had gotten in the cage, uh, had, had, you know, grabbed his teammate, they were hugging, they fell down, and, and then Goddard comes over. Where's security at during all this? Well, okay, and, and Carlisle, that's you... That they, look, that, that, I would say that that's not to say that McGregor is not accountable for his actions. He is. But if you have halfway decent security, McGregor never gets over the cage in the first place. How many Bellators have you been to live? You've been to quite a few, right? A couple, yeah. And you've been at the media row, right, for your seats, or have they put you in the uh, general audience? Uh, for Bellator, uh, uh, media, yeah. Okay, so you're in that media row, right on the other side of the guardrail, right? Mm-hmm. Conor McGregor was in, area that, it was in an area that I don't think you and me have ever been in. He was in that yeah. tech zone area. They keep all of us general media even on the other side of that barricade. So just in a flaw with Bellator security, there's usually more security trying to keep everybody out from that tech zone. Like here in Albuquerque when they had Rampage Jackson and uh, Cyborg right. sitting cage side. They expect those people of the industry, of those special seats to be able to control themselves of the manner of professionals. I guess this grows onto the UFC and onto Bellator to tell Conor McGregor, you are no longer allowed in these venues as a spectator. Or what are we to do? Just chain that little dude to his freaking chair to make him sit there? Micah, next time, Scott Coker will personally tell Conor McGregor which path is the quickest path to, to get up to the cage and get up over. But believe me, Bellator loves this. And in a weird way, I can kind of get it. If I'm UFC, I'm a little irked because my biggest attraction made a splash and was all over the closest thing to a competition we have TV program. But if you're UFC, if you're Dana White, you probably want to wheel Conor in just a little bit. And not so much from that standpoint because he, he wound up on a Bellator broadcast, but this is your guy. This is your cash cow. This is the guy you want to get back in your cage you don't want him doing anything that's going to get him arrested, that's going to get him in trouble with athletic commissions or anything like that. I would think if I'm UFC, I'm trying to come up with some way to gently reel Connor in just a little bit when he's supporting his team at fights around the world. And now we're talking about it from a general media view. We've talked about it from a commission view. How do you think John Kavanaugh, the coach of SBG, how do you think he handles this? What do you think he thinks of Connor, a kid that he's had around since he's 13? Does he think, oh, that's lovable Connor? Do you think he possibly thinks this is getting to his head and it's too much trouble? Or do you think this may be giving his team at all a bad name? Or do they just think this is the stereotypical Irishman, the crowd loved it, who cares, this is who we are? What he really thinks deep down, I don't think matters. I think what Kavanaugh realizes, and probably what everybody else realizes, is they need McGregor more than McGregor needs them. So I, I, as long as it doesn't go beyond what it's gone to at this point, I, I think you probably just grin and bear it.
stuff count as your cash cow? I guess so. Uh, again, more and more we get away from martial arts. We get into this business world, and I blame every. I blame everything I hate about MMA on Conor McGregor by now, and I can't wait for Ferguson <laughs> or Nurmagomedov were against him, and I can't wait for everybody to still love him even after he gets tapped or snapped. You know, I, I don't understand your hatred for Conor McGregor, Micah. I, I really don't. It, it's not so much a <laughs> hatred towards Conor, because the person he is is great. It's the embracing of the antics, and then I'm thinking about when someone else rushes the cage, when someone else jumps in and attacks a fighter, and their defense is going to be, I did it because nothing happened to Conor McGregor. Just like Colby Covington no. called Brazilians dirty animals because nothing happened yeah. when Conor McGregor talked shit. Because nothing happened when Co when Chow Sonnen said they're ignorant kids playing in the mud while me and all of my friends were talking about our retirement plans. Because things didn't happen like that. Somebody escalates it to a level where it does become a situation. And Conor McGregor, I've seen, has just jumped over a cage to what could lead to a theoretical, dangerous, riot-like situation that I will blame him for giving that person the impression was okay to start. Here's what I think, Micah. I think you need to start a companion podcast to this one. Uh, you could just call it simply This Week and Why I Hate Conor McGregor. And I think you could easily do an hour each week. And look, I, I, I'm, I'm kidding, of course. I, I like to push your buttons on Conor because I know that is a hot button issue for you. I get where you're coming from, and certainly a lot of people feel that way. But you know it, and I know it, when you make a lot of people money, people will look the other way when you do dumb and screwy things, up to a point. Now, and therein lies the predicament. When do you step in? Do you wait for something super out of control to happen? And then you step in after the fact, and you try to head it off at the path? As it relates to Connor, I don't know how many people can actually tell him what to do. You know, you, whether it's, you know, you, you look at his negotiations with USC for his next fight, when they agreed to let him fight Mayweather, he says, yes, I'll definitely come back to USC, I'll definitely come back to, to USC. Now, he, he, he wants, you know, pro, uh, promoter's credit to come back, he wants part of the company again. I mean, who really controls Conor McGregor other than Conor McGregor? I've been controversial on that topic, but my last thought is saying who's going to control him? Mark Goddard is going to control him. The only thing that I can see controlling Conor McGregor in these situations that we're talking about is that when his team is put on cards, officials refusing to work those fights for fear of what Conor McGregor may do. And, and I'm talking about we don't have to control Conor in the UFC, in his fights, in his events. We obviously just have to control what he does when his team is on the card, and that is more just, again, a direct reflection of what has to happen to his team. You're not allowed to bring Connor. We're scared to work those events. Your guys cannot participate in those events. No referee is willing to officiate that fight. Sorry, you can't fight on the card. That would be something. And, and at that point in time, if the referees, at that, at that point in time, you're forcing commissions to take action. And maybe that's the only way something like that happens. That would be my best recollection. That would be... And it's not like we got to control... Even I wish we could control the fucking stupid shit he does at promos. I'm just more worried about <laughs> in events where his teammates are fighting. Becoming a hooligan and losing his head. But as for his negotiation tactics, I want to call him dirty. I want to say it's immoral. But let's go talk to Cub Swanson about how many times he was supposed to fight for a UFC title. And all of a sudden... You get an injured Frankie Edgar, and it was down to Edgar versus Swanson, reportedly. Swanson's not the immediate replacement. They give it to Jose Aldo. So I guess you got to play hardball because the UFC isn't giving anybody any softballs. Clay Guida's got to go out and beg on TV. This is my last fight. I'd like to end it here, and I'd like to get a raise if you guys would be so willing. So I guess i got to embrace what Connor's doing on the financial side of it because... The UFC, it's not like they're not scoundrel-like scoundrel -like in their negotiation tactics. No, and Mike, you're 100% right on that. In today's UFC, it's the squeaky wheel that, that gets the oil. Uh, if you want attention, if you want them to do something for you, you have to call people out, you have to call them out, you have to do it publicly. 
you know, back in the day, you stepped in the cage, you did your job, you won your fights, and that got you to the next level. Unfortunately, in today's UFC, maybe MMA in general, that's not the way it works. There's You've got to be a personality. You've got to be outgoing. Apparently, outgoing. Apparently, you have to talk trash and put down fans. You know, it, it's all those things. For better or for worse, that's what we're looking at today. Now, also, I would agree, though, in that way of promoting, and I, I'm pretty sure you'll agree with me, Bellator does go a different way than the UFC. You don't hear as much smack talk, I believe, in Bellator matchups. But also, Bellator is not like it doesn't have its own squeaky wheels. Coming up this weekend... Uh, in Israel, John Salter's now in the co-main event due to injuries. If you guys know what I'm talking about, John Salter's won like eight fights in a row, 4-0 in Bellator, has been promised a middleweight title shot twice, but thanks to what they needed to do in contract negotiations with Gegard Mousasi, we're going to shut up about that title shot. You don't get it. Take your just desserts. So... Even though there's not the trash talk, they still each kind of little shady in promoting these days, right? Uh, yeah, well, th- that's probably fair to say. And having to make promises, do you think that's just part of what they have to do as the promoters to try to win this uh, ratings war, I guess is what we're in? Yeah, I, look, I mean, it's... To some degree, now, some sports are different because, you know, you have players or athletes under contract to teams, but... Whether it's boxing, whether it's MMA, even professional wrestling to a degree, yeah. I mean, it's, I, I don't want to, you know, besmirch the good name of promoters and organizations out there, but, but it is kind of the wild, wild west to a certain degree, and you have to offer this guy something you wouldn't offer the other guy, and, you know, promise him this. It, maybe it's a little shady, but it's, it's the way you do business, I guess. Again, I just feel bad for the guys that have been putting in the work. Again, a John Salter who's beat everybody. But, hey, you don't have the biggest name, buddy. So uh, we'll talk about that whole title shot later. Just just keep winning. Just keep winning and maybe one day we'll care about you. <laughs> yeah, I guess. And right now, Bellator also, they're, it looks like the last two weeks, they've kind of hit a little... Uh, if it wasn't for Conor McGregor, they probably don't get the ratings that they got last weekend because of injuries. They lost the main event with James Gallagher and... It, Ireland, and to, and this weekend it also came out, they lost Pitbull Patricio for Friday for this weekend's Bellator card in Israel, so now you're bumping up Noad Lahat versus Jeremy Libido in the co-main, of, in the main event from the co-main event. Does this do incidents like that push Bellator to make some of these bigger, splashier moves with the heavyweight tournament as we're scratching our head because they need these headlines? Well, what it should push them to do is build more stars. And, you, you know, it, it, if you don't have Pitbull in your name it, and you're not over 40 years old, it's hard to get pushed in Bellator. And there's a lot of talent there, but you've got to give people a reason to care about them. And when you're really only focusing on three or four guys and you have injury situations pop up, pop up it really makes it difficult for you to, to fill those injuries and put on cards that people are going to want to see, that are going to want to tune into Spike and watch. And that's something that's bit Bellator a couple of times here over the last several weeks. I, I Many times here I've interviewed Syed Awad, Daniel Strauss, longtime Bellator fighters. I still don't feel like the general Spike viewing audience knows who some of these guys are that have been these Bellator cornerstones. Like a David Rickles. If Rickles wasn't fighting, I, I think, in Thackerville or Kansas City, wherever his hometown is, and they weren't eating up his entrances, I don't know if Bellator has done a good job of promoting these home-growing guys where my frustration with them becomes they just try to live off of UFC coattails where I don't even think they ever gave Andre Korshikov or Douglas Lima the deserved push they should get. But yet, you'll see, Bobby Lashley's not in a tournament, but you can find him in a Dave & Buster's commercial next to A.J. McKee. Uh, Baby Slice is 2-0, and o, but he has a Burger King commercial. Yeah, and, and see, you know, you, you brought up Daniel Strauss. I, I think Strauss is, is phenomenal. But you're right, they don't push him. I, I don't think they 
put him in the best spots for people to see just how good he is. And, and that, you know, again, that's a prime example. It, you know, rather than put in the, the effort to, to build stars, they feel like it's easier just to go grab. And I'm not knocking Roy Nelson, who, who I was about to use as an example, as an example there, but, but to go grab him or go grab someone else for, from USC, a, a Chael Sonnen. And look, there's a place for guys like that, but you've also got to respect your homegrown talent and build them up as well. You and did. Bellator really falls short uh, doing that, and, and it's really disheartening. You're right. I love watching the Pro Fighters League, ACB, uh, KSW, these promotions from around the world, because I could tell you guys, MMA has one of the deepest talent pools for all sports in all of the world. It's like how there's a million great soccer leagues out there when you really look through all the countries. There are tons of great fighters everywhere. Bellator has lacked in developing and bringing up their own talent and really promoting those guys. Unless they've been a former UFC star or they've fallen in love with you as a collegiate prospect. There is Ed Ruth, there is Aaron Pico, there are those couple blue chip athletes that they've really clung to, but they haven't, I think, shown the greatness of there is talent in the world. They've went for guys that already have names instead of showing, this guy was great, you just didn't know about him, where I believe those guys are out there. No, I think you're right, and, and even a guy like, like Aaron Pico, they, they, you know, when when they finally decide to debut him, that honestly, they put him in a fight. And, you know, he was a little bit over his head, and he loses. So, you know, you're finally telling people to to care about this person, and then you put them in a position to fail. But now you've got to go back and try to get people to to care about them again. And I know he came back in and won his last fight, and, and that's great, but. You know, in addition to building these guys up, you have to do it the right way. You can't just throw a guy out there and then be surprised when he loses to someone who has more experience and is a better fighter than him. You know, when we talk about it, maybe we make it sound like it's harder than it is, but it really shouldn't be that difficult to, to shine a spotlight on some of these fighters, whether it's vignettes, you know, interviews, media availabilities, whatever, you know, to, to get these guys out in front of people and give you a reason to care about them. It shouldn't be that difficult. And on that Aaron Pico train, I think they're almost trying too hard because they put him over his head yeah. against the guy with the record, so they didn't even want to give him somebody around his record. They again with Zach Riley gave him a guy above his head, but if you guys don't know Zach Riley and you're not on the inside like I am... He took that fight on short notice, and he moved up a weight class to take on Pico. So Bellator was still, oh, look, Aaron Pico, only a second fight, but we're giving him a guy with, like, eight fights. But they were eight fights at a much lower weight class. They realized Pico was a 45er after he tried at 55. No fault on him for that. But then they gave him a 35er, and they tried to make him look good. So I think that Bellator... It bothers me to see an MMA promotion going in a boxing route where they're trying to find opponents. Where they, even for the Penn State card, they announced Ed Ruth and Phil Davis will be in action against the opponents to be named. You don't see the UFC doing that. And the one thing I can respect about the UFC in a lot of these situations is that it is still competitor versus competitor will give you both guys' stories walking into the cage to where Bellator gives you that boxing aspect. The more they talk about the guy, you kind of already know who they think is going to win. Yeah, you know, I, I think that, you know, I, I, I don't disagree with what you said there. And, and look, think about Bellator here. They, what, in the last six months, that they bring in Goldberg, uh, they bring in Ronaldo. You've got all these announcers Put them to work voice on it, voicing over some vignettes or something to, to get these guys over. Uh, you've got the people in place to get them over. Get them over. It shouldn't be that hard. Definitely, I agree with you. They have Viacom. It seems they have the ability when they need it. I don't know why there's not more uh, countdown to Bellator's. Uh, you know, lead up to Bellator's. I don't know mm -hmm. why when they're in this, they still feel like they're one toe in the water as a company. We're going to put all the money out there to steal Rory McDonald. We're going to put all the money out there to steal Gegard Mousasi, to get Lorenz Larkin. But then we're not going to put anybody over. Uh, I think the last special we got was Living Rampage or something. Yeah. 
Sounds right. So, still some kind of Viacom-esque moves, but I guess we all gotta rejoice that they're finally talking about a heavyweight title. It's not just the elephant in the room. No, and yeah, I, I, I guess we should take you know what, what we can get. I, I, I'm glad they're addressing the heavyweight addressing the heavyweight title situation. Uh, I'd like it if all the people in, in the tournament were actually heavyweights, but you know, baby steps, I guess, right? Right, and then. I've already kept you much longer than I meant to this week. Uh, did you have any chance to check out the UFC event this past weekend? I know you were covering the Lobo game. Yeah, no, I DVR'd it. I watched it uh, when I got back. Uh, not the greatest of nights for Diego Sanchez, for sure. I, I thought Matt Brown uh, looked really impressive. Uh, the, the elbow he threw to, to, to get the win was phenomenal. I'm curious to see what Matt does from here on out. That's, Diego says he wants to keep fighting. Uh, who am I to tell him he can't? Um, but he does not look like the same fighter he, he used to. I felt that the dodson um, Morales fight was good. Uh, it was entertaining. A little disappointing than what I saw from John, though. I'd like to see a, a little bit more. I'd like to see more out of Dotson. I wish Diego wouldn't fight. But he wants to continue, so he will. The UFC will let him, because if they didn't, Bellator sure as heck will. If not, Combates America, I believe, would do it. Andre Orlovsky beat a guy in a diaper. Orlovsky looked a lot better against a one-dimensional fighter. Yeah. Uh, no, I, yeah, I, I, and, you know, look, I, I thought that the main event was good. Uh, Boye was very impressive. Uh, disappointed, I thought we'd see a little more from Anthony Pettis than we saw. But, um... You know, good kudos to, to Poye. Look forward to seeing what's next for him. I, I, I thought that was a good card overall. What I saw about that main event, it more spoke volumes about, I think, how far Jim Miller has fallen. As we saw his last fight against uh, Francisco Trinaldo look bad, his fight against Anthony Pettis looked even worse. That gave a lot of people the thoughts that Pettis could become a world beater again. Dustin Poirier looked great yeah. with his wrestling, em implemented the same pressure boxing to take down scheme that Eddie Alvarez, Gilbert Melendez, Rafael Dos Anjos had all implemented against Pettis. Pettis, I think, has honestly honestly hit his ceiling but that doesn't mean that he's not still going to get a lot of wins it's just we now know what kind of flashy fighter his he is his boxing hasn't come along but he is ever dangerous off his back how many triangles did he get Poye in even will getting smashed up on the bottom and then in just in a freak injury but a great move by Dustin Poye he had Got the back of Pettis in the first round. Pettis was able to turn around in the guard. He got the body triangle in the third round and did not let go of it, which caused that rip to pop out of place. So a great win for Poirier. Dotson Marais. I had it 29-28 Dotson. I thought he won the first and the third rounds, but I can go 29-28 Marais winning the second and third rounds. The whole thing that I got to beef with those judges is how at all you score the first round for Marais when the striking was even, Dotson scored a knockdown, got poked in the eye, and kicked in the nuts. Even though there was no point dispute, it still mentally to me, judging the fight is a little knock against that fighter because you fouled. No, and I agree with you on your assessment of the Dotson fight. Here's the problem, though, and this is something that John seems to have fallen into in his last two fights, um, trying to do just enough and then letting the judges you know, decide it. Probably, especially in this day and age, probably not the best way to, to, to go about fighting. I would just like to see John do a little more to, to try to separate himself from his opponent in terms of strikes and all that and, and make the wins a little more convincing. I, I'm with you. I, I had it 2-1 for, for, for Dodson, but, you know, at the end of the day, if you leave it in the hands of the judges, stuff like that happens. It was wild, and I'm not sure if you saw, also, real quick to let everybody know, on uh, Saturday night, also, there was Copa Combate. Combate's America had a one-night 
$100,000 tournament, and I gotta explain this to everybody because the rules were kind of interesting to me. The semifinals was a run round, five minute round, no elbows. The quarterfinals were three three minute rounds, so we're going amateur fight, no elbows. And then the final was a full amateur fight, three three minute rounds with elbows. Combates America gave away $100,000, and the reserve for the tournament won the fight because a guy missed weight so embarrassingly that they sent his ass home. Isn't that like a heroic story to hear about? <laughs> Gotta love it. Gotta love it. Mexican MMA. And it was great because Juliana Pena and Gilbert Melendez were the commentators. Again, so many commentators or fighters jumping over to commentating. I wish we could just see a couple more jump into the judging into the judging booth and jump into the refereeing ring. Which brings me to another cool thing. Uh, the New Mexico Predators Jackson Wink amateur team fought the uh, Team Alpha Male team. I'm not sure about the uh, full results of the event, but Chris Lieben, the crippler, was one of the referees for it. And that, I'm sure, was an event that was refereed in the proper manner and good to see a fighter jumping in to take control of MMA in that manner. Interesting. Look, you've been on this. Maybe you should start a workshop to, to, to get fighters to, to make that transition to judges. Because this is something, not the first time I've heard you bring this up, but I've heard you bring this up several times now. Uh, you know, maybe this is something, you know, we can all get on board with, rather than everybody trying to transition into commentating, be judges. Right, I'm like, you guys know much more, and then I always hear, these judges don't know what they're watching, and I'm like, but you do. So just put you in that position. Feels like it would be a simple solution to a vitally asked question. How do we make judging better? How do we make judges more informed? You put more informed people in the judging and referee positions. Makes sense to me. <laughs> Mike and Carlisle, always great getting to talk MMA and combat sports with you. Thank you for joining me this week, sir. Anytime, Mike, anytime. I kept Michael Carlisle way longer than I expected, damn near an hour. I meant to just have him for one segment, had to let him go so he can go prepare for the 610 KML Sports Bar. His show, you guys check it out. If you're in the New Mexico area, 610 AM, 3 to 7, Monday through Friday, Michael Carlisle, Mike Trujillo, I join them every Tuesday, 4 to 4.30, dropping a little promo in there for you guys. We're talking about the UFC event, a couple other notes that we didn't get to talk about. Rafael Asuncao, ooh, boy, has some power. We knew about that, those inside leg kicks just ripping apart Matthew Lopez. That right hand found the chin. Asuncao, in a deep, exciting 135-pound division, is the quiet prospect, the quiet contender nobody talks about. Clay Guida, that overhand right, left overhand was black, but the uppercut cracks Joe Lozon, the ground and pound, Joe Lozon, Hitting a snag in his career again where he had hit a peak, slumping again. But Clay Guida, back from that trip to featherweight, 2-0 and again at lightweight. The Carpenter nailing things down, putting in some great work, had laid a foundation. The frame is putting his house, that martial arts house he has, together nicely. Tatiana Suarez, 4-0, and now 5-0, and a dominant decision over Pereira. The wrestling, again, superb in the grappling. We wish we would have seen more ground and pound and a killer instinct out of Suarez. But still, that young lady with that caliber of wrestling and grappling control, still a threat to one day become a strawweight champion. UFC Fight Night 120. Quick results are up at cagedminds.com. A couple other things to talk about from this week on the MMA side of things. We had LFA 27 on Friday night in Shahi, Oklahoma. Robert Watley takedowns, vicious ground and pound, a third round TKO of Daryl Wilson, and still your LFA lightweight champion. Heck of a performance. Ryan Spann, talk about a heck of a performance. That laser, bam, straight hard right hand that spun Myron Dennis around, finished off Dennis, knocking him to the ground and beating him against the cage. You also had Alexander Hernandez beat Derek Adkins. Ooh, Alexander Hernandez, a top-notch-looking prospect. Very impressive. 
and Ed Klein Jr. getting a submission over Levi Queen in a bloody, bloody fight. LFA 27, Access TV, my Friday nights. I love watching LFA. The best prospects coming up in MMA always featured there. Also, Friday night, talking about some top caliber prospects you had as we talked about all the debacle from Bellator 187 with Conor McGregor. Didn't talk about the rear naked chokes, though. AJ McKee in the main event. Kevin Ferguson Jr. A great job by both men of slipping the left arm, the choke arm, all the way under, then completing the choke, doing it ninja style, and really locking it in. Great finishes. AJ McKee and still undefeated. We saw some holes in his game now. He's progressing. I'd like to see him still maybe an Emmanuel Sanchez before that world title fight. And now we know that Pitbull versus Daniel Weichel has been put off, it looks like, till 2018. February is when Pitbull would like to get back in there. Not sure if AJ McKee will get the opportunity to tie John Jones for being the youngest MMA champion ever. But still progressing in the right way. We know he likes to play around the outside. Got cut. Looked tired, made it to the third round, and pulled out the win. So still positives for the young McKee. Talking about prospects and coming along in the world of combat sports. I spent my I spent my Saturday night. It was an evening of boxing at the Manuel Lujan Complex on the Expo New Mexico grounds. Presented by Legacy Boxing Promotions. Battle for the Brave. The ladies got the night started. And we saw Jordan Garcia push forward, land the heavier punches, and taking a unanimous decision win in the grudge match, match against Katie Ramirez. Hopefully, these two can go back to being friends now that they've got the competition out of the way. That bout was followed up by Ronnie Baca taking a majority decision win from Anthony Hill. A little up in the air, scoring. I went three rounds to one for Baca. Thought he won the decision easily. Worked behind his jab early. Went to the body with the big hooks late. Even busted Hill open over the left eye. That was followed up by Matt Esquivel getting knocked down. Touching the ground from a big right hand from Christopher Russell. Russell, get over Zeus looking for that knockout. Would push Esquivel down, almost getting that second knockdown. Esquivel would recover. They're exchanging big in the pocket. Huge left hook na- lands. And I'm talking about knockout of the year time material stuff. Undefeated Papita is now 10-0 Matthew Esquivel. Christian Cabral, he gets in the win column, taking a unanimous decision from Tavares T. Push the pace, push the pressure, and put together big combinations. A good win for the Puma. Matthew Diamond Boy Griego looking to make that jump from prospect to contender. Taking on 64 fight vet Alejandro Moreno, doing something to get noticed. The Diamond Boy started off with his jab, followed it with big hooks, putting Moreno against the ropes and unleashing on him. Matthew Griego gets the finish in between in between round three and round four as the corner would throw in the towel, the Moreno corner. Only the third person ever is Matthew Diamond Boy Griego to stop Moreno, a contender in the making right there, Diamond Boy. The co-main event, Brian Lalbala Mendoza remains undefeated at 16-0. and The first two knockdowns were doubled up right hands to the body. One in the end of the second round. Early into the third round came that second. And then the left hook 40 rounds in t- 40 seconds into round three finishes off John David Charles. That shot to the body. Devastating. Call Mendoza instead of Lalbala the body snatcher. Jason Sanchez remains undefeated in the main event. All credit to Stefan McIntyre taking this fight on day's notice after Reese Alim got a cut and was unable to compete. The doctors said no. The doctors from Vegas, he would not make it to Albuquerque, New Mexico. Sanchez would work early off the jab, would put the pressure together, would stay in the face of McIntyre, would land some big shots to the body was trying to peel the hands off to get the overhand, but a tight guard, a defensive shell from McIntyre. If you're not offensive, you're not going to win. The volume of Sanchez led to the win, but a couple times the left hook 
of McIntyre did stun Sanchez. A couple holes in the defense, something for Jason to go back to the gym, look at, and work on. A little susceptible to the left uppercut and the left hook. But still, on a couple days' notice, against a wily veteran of opponent, a very solid performance from Jason Sanchez. The red corner went undefeated, 7-0. and We have seven post-fight interviews up at Cage Minds MMA Show on YouTube, or go check out the post-fight interviews from Battle for the Brave post we have up at CageMinds.com. Gotta send out a congratulations, because also this past weekend, on Friday night, Jamie Hinshaw from Fit NHB with a rear naked choke technical submission victory, putting Melissa Karganis to sleep, becomes the new King of the Cage Adam Weight champion of the world. A big shout out to Jamie, who I've had the pleasure of interviewing several times, but on a sour note to the extremely beautiful story, in route to victory. And this even shows the warrior, the warrior spirit and heart that Hinshaw has more. Hinshaw did so, winning the title with a broken arm. As of yet, I've had a little communication with her on some pain meds. When she's clear-headed, we'll find out the timeline. But did suffer a broken arm in winning the world title. Fit NHB now with four King of the Cage champions currently. Sadia Parker. Tim Sosa, Nico Montano, who you've been watching on the Tough series going on. Check out this Wednesday. I believe Nico will be back in action for the other two quarterfinals. And I'm going to take a moment to try to gather myself what else is going on this weekend, actually. Can't forget, we had talked with Ben Acosta. We had him on Red Menace TV last week. Rubicon 6, in conjunction with supporting... Colton's Heroes this coming weekend in Colorado Springs. Our guest last week, Cole Griego, fighting for the amateur flyweight title. Slade Ring from the Jackson Wink Academy is defending his amateur bantamweight title. On the pro side of the card, again, Ben Acosta, who was my guest on last week's Red Menace TV on ProView Networks, which you can check out ProView Networks on YouTube or Channel 26 ProView Networks on Concav. Comcast if you're in our local Albuquerque area. Also on the card, Flavian Pilgrim, who I've had the pleasure of interviewing several times. So you got the Jackson Wink Academy sending representatives out there to Rubicon, Colorado Springs, the Colorado Springs Convention Center. If you have the time to make it out there, the main event featuring Top Shelf Entertainment Lightweight Champion Adam V. Hill, a top prospect from the Colorado area to keep an ear out for. This weekend, the UFC is in Australia. You got Tamora ver- David Tibora versus Fabricio Marcin Tibora versus Fabricio Verdum in the main event down under two heavyweights. You have got to favor Verdum and his incredible ground game. But anything can happen when two heavyweights stay standing. We all know that big boys throw hard and knockouts just poof happen out of thin air. The co-main event of women's flyweight bout, Rowdy Beck Rollins taking on short notice replacement, Jessica Rose Clark. Rollins, having known about this event, having been prepared, having been so focused on her flyweight debut, fighting at home, the pressures of an octagon debut, I like Beck Rawlings in this fight, you got Fit NHB's Tim Means on short notice against Bilal Muhammad, I don't believe that Muhammad is on the same level of striking as Means, there's level to this shit, Jake Matthews versus Baglan Vol- Borgon Valelichis is also on the main card. That is going to be a banger. Elias Theodoro versus the always ever tough Daniel Kelly is going to be a scrappy affair. Alexander Volkanovsky versus Humberto Bangay. Two top-notch featherweight prospects. I love the talent coming up in the featherweight division. Do not get me started on that one. A fun night of fights coming. You also have to look forward to on the fight pass prelims. Alexis Chambers versus undefeated Nadia Kasim. Check that one out. 
flyweight action with Jin Lao Laos versus Eric Shelton. You got UFC Fight Night from Australia on Saturday night. A fun little card. Bellator is in Israel. John Salter, Nawad Lahat. Look for them to put in work. This has been Caged Minds Uncensored. Again, thank you to Michael Carlisle for joining me this week. A shout out to MAC-10, MMA, CK10, Edwin Ruiz, supporting combat sports athletes and Caged Minds all the time. Thank you for the support, sir. Check them out on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all of your social media. We will see you guys live next time for your local New Mexico action, December 1st. Jackson Wink Fight Night at his Letter Resort and Casino. Main event, Damasio Page and Jesus Urbina. This has been Caged Minds Uncensored. Keep up with us. Twitter and Instagram, Caged Minds MMA, Caged Minds Combat Sports News on Facebook. Knockout of the Night from Battle of the Brave. Knockout of the Year again. Matthew Papitas, Escabel, Fighter of the Night. It's hard to choose between the destruction that was put together by Matthew Diamond Boy Grego and Brian Mendoza. Stars on the rising from the New Mexico boxing scene.